Hello, dear audience. We are back again. We uh, decided to make the second show to relatively finish this topic. We were speaking about humility during the last conversation, and we came to a point where uh, we have to speak about humility being the tool, the quality that the somebody needs to relate to other people. Sometimes people suffer from the fact that they don't even have friends. And I have found in my own life that pride has to do a lot with it. When somebody is very proud, it keeps them uh, from away from other people. You cannot relate with other people in a way that they will become your friend because you are up there and they cannot reach you. And this reminds me of a love story between a poor boy and a rich girl. The boy is a musician and he goes out in a small boat into the sea and plays on his little violin. And then there was this rich big house on the shore that had a window towards the sea. And sometimes he goes and plays underneath the window and there was this young girl coming out of the window and attending to his music. After a while, uh, they come very close, and he proposes her to get married. But her answer from up there, from the window, was that we are apart from each other. You are down there, and I'm up here. We cannot go any further than you playing for me from there and me listening here. The story um, develops very ironically. The person becomes the little boy becomes a very famous musician. And the girl, she was just a rich girl. And when he was very famous, he visits his town and has a big concert, and everybody is almost worshipping him. And the girl, after the concert, goes to his room and says, reminds him about who she is. And uh, the young gentleman who was very famous, he says, well, I think you missed your chance. Now I'm up there and you're down there. We cannot relate to each other. This is a small story. It has its ups and downs, but it shows the relationship between two people and how much the pride can um, be an obstacle between uh, two people to relate closely. And so uh, we are uh, going to speak about the humility and being able to pick up the phone and call our friend if we need help. Uh, again, from my own experience, I would share this. Uh, when I was in a kindergarten, my, uh, I haven't shared this with many, many people, and I want everybody to know about this. This is a very typical example. Uh, everybody was making uh, p uh, little pictures from cut pa pieces of papers. And my teacher took mine and did herself, and it was perfect. When my parents came, she introduced the application on the wall and said, look, your son did this, and it's very beautiful. That was a really painful uh, thing to do. For me, I felt that it wasn't right. I was probably only four years old, but that uh, the voice of righteousness raised in me, and. I felt that she was not telling the truth. She did it, and that's why it's beautiful. If I had done it, it wouldn't be beautiful. But even in that age, uh, I realized if I reveal this truth, I will be ashamed because I cannot do perfect. And it's good now my parents are proud of me because of my work. And through entire my life, I never forgot this example, that when we are proud, we want to be good then we don't reveal the truth to the others. So um, I would like to speak about confession today a little bit, Presbyterian. If you would, please explain us why is it important for someone to be humble in, in this relationship, your professional idea about this. Could we begin a little bit with a review since we mm -hmm. don't know who will be tuning in right now? Sure. And uh, please keep the topic of confession in mind because um, uh, I, I see our direction also in go going in that, in that way uh, in our conversation today. Um, but with the, the example that you gave both from that little love story 
and of yourself in kindergarten <laughs> um, beg a couple of lessons just right now. And the first is that, well, in the first story of the, the lovers that didn't meet because of their, their pride, uh, and they both, and there were two chances in, in their lives to do that, reminds me that um, we go around with our own conceptions of ourselves. And that's okay, because that's the best we have and that's what we do. But when we go around with the conceptions of who we are, in the, and I'll add, in the presence of God, we have to remember, since they are always in the presence of God, that God is not done with us yet. And so our conceptions of who we are are never to be static. That how I understand myself to be today may change by tonight or be completely different by tomorrow morning or 10 years from now. And so that's kind of a humbling reality in itself, that we're holding our, our own identities loosely. We can't hold on to them tightly, because if we hold on to them tightly, we wind up defining reality as opposed to God defining the reality in the long run, and, and losing a lot of opportunities as in that story, for example, of more love, more life, more change, but my gosh, trading up. And, and, and they, these two, while well, their lives, let's say, the, the rich little young woman uh, may have been a, a, a rich older woman and, and, a, and a musician that was a poor street musician became a famous musician, but they still lost out on so much uh, because of their tight fist definition of who they thought they were. That was it. The example that you gave yourself, from yourself, I'm sorry, about, about the, the four-year-old not wanting to displease mom and dad. Uh, because of, of this, what the teacher did. Now, I think the audience, and, and now you as an adult, know what she was doing, and it was very sweet, and she probably thought you were a wonderful student, and, mm -hmm. and, thought she, and she probably saw things in you that even now you don't realize what she saw in you, and she really wanted to promote you to, her to your parents in a good way. I wasn't planning to say that, but I <laughs> also thought that. But your story, just on the surface, and uh, on a deeper analysis, uh, points to the four-year-old Arhadi, or four- or five-year-old Arhadi, in that moment, falling to the temptation of the desire to be loved more than the desire of loving the truth. Mm -hmm. Now, when we are adults doing that, we call that people-pleasing. We wind up chasing the affection or the approval or the inclusion of others at the expense of the love for truth. And that's also uh, and truth for us as a person. And that also is uh, an example of pride. Actually, the sin of self-love in relationship with others. Not healthy love for self, which we are all supposed to uh, love your neighbors, you love yourself. Well, that means something when the, when the scriptures tell us that. But love of self, where we are the object and we desire the commodity of the attention, the approval, the love of others at the expense of truth. That's really important. And so what that means is that if we are really striving to grow in humility, this being right-sized in the presence of God, owning the miracle of being specks of dust created in, in the image and likeness of God, that we have to seek humility from our heart. It's not just, oh, what's the most humble thing I can do right now? When I go into automatic, I'm automatically also cutting myself off from e immense parts of my own being, my own deeper uh, self. And sure, I can live that way maybe the rest of my life. A lot of people might be doing that. But I'm missing out on a lot of opportunities for my own growth and richness. And so when we engage the issue of humility on a daily level, on an hourly level, we need to be engaging it from our hearts as best as we know how. Why? Because it's a dynamic quality. That's something I forgot to mention in the previous visit with you. Um, it's dynamic in the sense of it is living. It is never the same. It is always taking us someplace because it's a dynamic when we are humble in the presence of God, when we are right-sized in the presence of God. It's kind of like being on a conveyor belt, that as we're doing what we're doing, we're on the right convey conveyor belt, belt of going where we need to be going in our lives. Uh, and hopefully that conveyor belt of God's providence <laughs> that's under our feet 
will lead us places, help us become the kind of persons that we would never have imagined had we been trying to do things under our own power and our own wisdom solely. And so the dynamic of humility, it's a dynamic, it's growing, it's living, it's not static, it's not just a, a, a rule to, to that, that, that holds us frozen to something, but it helps us become more supple, um, uh, and, and like children, more innocent, and that's a, a discussion we've had in the past about being childlike. As we grow in humility, we grow in innocence. We grow in childlikeness, not necessarily childishness, but childlikeness. And so um, that's the foundation to wisdom for adults today mm -hmm. in the presence of God. I would like uh, to explain a little bit about uh, comparison. Because when you say about the right size, being right-sized, and know what is, what is your ability and who you are in the correct form, the tool for this sometimes is the comparison. And that's I think, is quite a bad thing that people do to compare themselves with, uh, with others. I find myself doing the same thing. To evaluate myself, I compare to others. I'm 33 years old. Okay, this person is 34 or 32. What is my situation or my achievement compared to him? What did he achieve in his 33 years? What did I achieve? And that brings kind of disharmony into, into human beings' lives. We talked about this in a previous visit, but I think it's a very good question that we should return to from time to time, that oftentimes when we do this com com a kind of comparison, in fact, the vast majority of the time when we compare in this way, you know, when, when parents compare one child against another, that's very dangerous, all right? When friends do that to each other or in our own professional lives, uh, it can be very dangerous because we're putting ourselves in a context in our own minds and hearts of shaming. Someone is the winner, someone is the loser. And so uh, when we enter the field of comparison, the, it's a very slippery slope, very dangerous, and we, we should do it with the alarm bells on in our minds. Ding, 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 we're in comparison land. Why? Because sometimes, and we, this is, we sort of came up with this together in, in a previous visit, sometimes, and it's a very small place, it's not very big, because the slippery, the slippery line is very, um, it, 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 it's within reach at all times of when we start comparing. It, it, we can do it in a benign way, just to have a sense of what's happening, to gauge what's happening in, in reality. But the second we start allowing it to puff, us our, puff ourselves up or to demean ourselves in such a way as to be life effacing to our, us or, or others, um, then we, we've slipped right into the shaming modality. So comparison, most of the time is dangerous. When it's not dangerous, we should be there in a very, for a very short amount of time just to benignly assess the situation. Even Jesus asked his apostles, um, what do people say I am? What do, what do they say? So you know, he's sort of asking his disciples to get a, a sense of what are people thinking, what are people saying? And so that was information finding. And so if we do it in the spirit of information finding, that it's probably, um, the most we can do, keep it brief, and then keep the focus on how we can um, manage the context we're in in a way that's most true and um, has the most integrity for, for ourselves. How accurate can be other people's opinion about, about oneself? Once at work, one of the employees said, you're very self-conscious. And then I find out in myself but really I am. I'm very conscious about myself. If people think about me this or they have opinion about me this, and I have to just relax and be what I am, who I am. What do you think about other people finding out your, about yourself more than you can find out about yourself? Well, even my, in my own relationship with my spiritual director, my spiritual father, he would say, even when people criticize you, and their hearts are not filled with goodwill, maybe their hearts are filled with malice. Mm -hmm. It's important to examine that feedback you receive and see if anything can be learned from it. 
but not take the malice to heart and not take their judgmentalism to heart. That's a hard thing to do. That's why it's good to speak to healthy people that we trust as friends or in a spiritual relationship um, to help us discern, uh, discern uh, more truthfully what is true for ourselves in, in that context in the presence of God. And I can't answer how that's going to be for every person. Uh, I, I just have found that as a principle, this is an important principle that's very helpful. Mm -hmm. Now we made our way into the relationship that, that takes place while somebody is confessing their sins. This is a very traditional method. It's present in, only in the traditional church, uh, meaning in, in Catholic and Orthodox churches. Uh, and a number of the uh, Reformed churches that are reclaiming the tradition for themselves. Okay. Not all, though, but mm -hmm. a number. I had, uh, as I told you earlier, that I have this friend who is a very humble man. He was my boss, and we worked together uh, shoulder to shoulder. He didn't mm -hmm. put any difference. Mm -hmm. um, he's a painter, and once we were discussing, during the breaks, we were discussing about spiritual stuff. He's a Protestant, and one of the differences that we discovered was the confession that in his practice that didn't exist. And he started asking questions, why, what difference does it make? Why would you tell your life to somebody else completely to a particular person? And what I discovered is that in their practice, they just tell each other, a group of people come together, just tell each other what they feel about themselves. And that's how they kind of um, humble themselves in front of each other. Uh, what, what is the importance of this? Uh, telling your life completely to somebody and trusting that person that he or she will help you and you will get out of these uh, situations. And Why has church kept this uh, institution, if you can call it institution, confession? Why is it important? This is, uh, again, a, an immense topic. Mm -hmm. From the beginning of the church's life, we have evidence that people confessed to one another. The scripture urges the brethren, the brothers and the sisters, to support one another, to bear each other's burdens, to help one another through their difficulties. And so when this happens, it means we have to come clean. And uh, coming clean is not to be split off. You know, in, in psychology, we talk about the phenomenon of splitting. And so when one splits people, for example, that might mean if I'm splitting you and Kelly, your wife, I might be treating you in, in, from a bad perspective, all my bad issues, and Kelly, all the good issues. And so that's an example of splitting. And so that kind of splitting divides one's heart, divides one's soul, divides one's own uh, relationship with God. And so God wants us whole. Um, to be perfect, in the, you know, what Jesus says, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. The Greek word for perfect in that circumstance is, uh, it, it relates to the word telos, which means be, uh, which means be, which, 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 which can mean perfection, but the end of perfection or actually the completion of complete perfection. And so another way to translate this might be to say uh, the Lord says, urges us to become whole, like his Father in heaven is whole. Well, that's still an impossible phenomenon when we think about that, but to meditate on what it means to be whole, so when we wind up splitting, when we wind up just giving people a little bit of ourselves here or there, when we wind up hiding something, that also means we're hiding something from God. Now, can we hide something from other people and have, uh, but have that be clear and surrender to God? Absolutely. At the same time, when we, that often, uh, that, that happens and, and it's okay to be private for a while, but there are opportunities that come in our lives when that will be shared somehow. Mm -hmm. Now, is it one person? Is it a mass of people? Well, the early church has had many examples. In the early church, uh, there was group confession. But when it started getting too big, for example, and for practical reasons, and, and not just that, but there were other reasons as well, uh, the church 
uh, uh, moved in the direction of uh, having this made private between their a priest and a pr and who has that the gift to understand people's hearts and has developed the prayer rule and the sacrament of confession, where there is an absolution at the end. Now, the prayer of absolution is a beautiful prayer, but when one reads the prayers of absolution, uh, it is a reconciliation to the church. And so what that's telling us is oftentimes in the life of the church, confession was used when there was grievous sin, because we all sin every day, so when there was a grievous sin. The Orthodox world today has a kind of uh, range of, of how confession is encouraged. In the Russian tradition, one cannot attend Eucharist unless they've had confession that within, you know, right before the service. In the Greek tradition, as long as, for example, um, each person is, in, is seeing their spiritual father um, and in a relationship with their spiritual father, they, can re they don't have to re have the absolution uh, prayers of absolution read uh, uh, weekly. That can be determined within the relationship of the private uh, situation between the person and the, their spiritual director, the, their spiritual father. There's also uh, the, the custom that has uh, been with us of confession without absolution um, uh, occurring where people um, recognize that uh, someone is mature in the Lord, a male or a female, and uh, will uh, come to them for spiritual direction as their spiritual father or mother and are guided that way. At the same time, that spiritual father or mother would discern when he or she would uh, go to uh, the church and speak to the pastor, the priest, and receive absolution. And so, and so these are people who have been guided um, in their lives, who have been, um, who become holy, uh, or, or at least are on their way to being holy, that um, uh, God inspires disciples to follow them for their own spiritual well-being. This is uh, with us for centuries, and it's still with us today. And um, in various parts of the Orthodox world, the witness is stronger. And, and you said at one time in the Armenian church, now it's struggling, this witness, because of the history that's, yeah. that, the, that the, the church has gone through in the past century. At the same time, uh, we are all, it's always new. And that those of us who are attempting to uh, grow more spiritually and are looking to have more spiritual direction in our own lives, because opening ourselves up to another person completely uh, uh, makes us more open uh, uh, to trusting ourselves in the presence of God. And sometimes we just need to hear someone else. We need to say the words out loud and hear someone else respond. It's, it's sometimes a very simple human desire. Do you think that this is a practice that the church has, the same similar practice that the psychologists have today? A lot of people turn to psych psychotherapists and psychologists for, for these issues. And it is interesting in the medical and in the psychological world that there is now more of a respect for spirituality. You know, they, it's now called the mind-body uh, connection. And, uh, and that's a good thing a lot of the time. Uh, it's also a dangerous thing because, uh, you know, you, uh, reading a few books or getting a, a certification, you know, from some institute over the Internet that makes you a spiritual expert is not someone I would necessarily want to go to personally for spiritual advice for my relationship with God and, and being right with, with Him and all the world um, in that way. There might be some people who've gotten, who, who, are, who are wonderful that way, but I, I would not run. I was going to ask you this, the opposite. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, in a modern life, we trust the knowledge. Mm -hmm. We trust the, the uh, expert, expertise of the person. Now, if we have a psychologist who has uh, three diplomas posted on the wall, we trust that person because we know he or she went to uh, schools and studied. But the reason I asked it has been replaced by psychology is because we go to the priest and we don't know, even know what kind of education he, this person has. Does he understand human psychology or not? But yet we trust and confess and that person helps us. Now, uh, 
Well, I would be careful with anyone I trust. I, they, they can have lots of degrees on the wall and they still might not be have integrity. <laughs> and they could be clergy or they could be psychologists, they could be psychiatrists. And so I would, be, uh, you know, I would be aware that it's all about the relationship and the integrity of the persons in the relationship. There are many people who are not necessarily Christian who have a lot of integrity and who are seekers of the truth. And for me, you know what I believe now, what the truth is, the truth is a person. And being in relationship with them is very healthy and nurturing and wonderful. And I, as, as an Orthodox Christian, am enlivened being in their presence because of their integrity and, and, and concern that's authentic for me as a person. That's very therapeutic. Mm -hmm. If they have a lot of training in psychology uh, and psychotherapy and how people um, can grow, all the better. And the same thing, yet in another way, uh, also applies to people in the church who are in ministry. Are we people living with integrity in the presence of God. Now, if we're doing it in the name of God, and if some of us are called to the priesthood and are directing people's souls, this is a mighty tall order. Uh, I have to say, and I'll say this on camera, there are many people that I've had to see who've um, come to my office as a result of bad confessions with clergy, mm -hmm. and where the confessions in the end were abusive. And, and where the advice was the exact opposite, I believe, of what they needed. And so it's a mess. When, it, when people um, uh, can't wait, be they in the clergy or be they in psychology or psychiatry, can't wait to be in a leadership position, but haven't done the real work. They've taken shortcuts. <laughs> now, when you said that, I want to bring Anthony Bloom's example, which d directs us to both direction. He says when he was a young priest, newly ordained, well, he wasn't very young, he was probably 35 or something. That's young. Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, he says that there was this sick person, his mother brought him to the priest and asked the priest to read healing prayers on him. She described his uh, situation, saying that this, his son is an artist, not very developed artist, it's like a hobby. And all of a sudden he has started saying that he smells green, he uh, tastes red and things like this. So he's having some issues and he's, sometimes he's out of um, reality. So the priests read the, the prayers on him and he comes, keeps coming of week after week. And Anthony says that I am watching from the side because I'm the youngest and I don't have much to say there. But he says that I'm also looking at this person from doctor's perspective because I'm also a doctor. And he uh, said that he went to the priest and suggested him to send this person to a doctor first because he has some psychological issues and the doctors have to see him instead of just reading the prayers on him. The priest didn't consider his opinion so he went to his mother and said that I want to see him. I'm a doctor and he has some medical issues. I have to help him as a medical professional. So he said that he doesn't explain how, but as a doctor he helped him. He took him out of that condition. And then after that he started giving him spiritual nourishment. That's what he says. He lacked that spirituality, but once he's already lost connection with the real world, you have to bring him back physically and then you can help him spiritually. He gives a very interesting phenomenon here. He says when he went into that uh, psychological situation, he was just doing uh, artwork as a hobby. When he came out of that, he was almost a professional painter. Uh, he explains this too, but this is not the point. But then in the end, there is a movie about him and the priest who took care of him on his last days, he says in the movie that uh, the Metropolitan called him to his room and said that I have a request. And he took out a list of people from his pocket and gave it to the priest and said, these are the people that I would like you to take care of and pray for them because they're probably his uh, spiritual children. And the priest said that this is a confidential list. I 
nobody will know but me about this because he trusted it to me. And uh, see here he says, these are, this is a list of people you have to pray for. And here he helps them physically as a doctor. He doesn't read prayers for him or he doesn't pray for them. He just goes and does something physically. This is why I wanted to have the priest versus psychologist or a doctor. And it's not a contest. And it's, not, it's an artificial dichotomy to say priest versus psychologist. Mm -hmm. If people, this is all God's creation. We should all just be showing up and doing our job. Okay. That's it. And our job is to serve God, glorify God in our lives, and treat our brothers and sisters on this planet, love them as we are called, we are called to love them as we love ourselves. That's our job. Um, and it's sad when these dichotomies have happened because the world has fallen and, and a lot of us take shortcuts. We take shortcuts to glory, mm -hmm. be it uh, religious glory, be it academic glory, and um, people pay a price after a while. Now, uh, just getting a little bit more deep in this issue of confessing and confessors, there's an expression from the ancient Celtic church regarding the spiritual director and um, the spiritual father, the spiritual mother in, in the Celtic tradition of the ancient ch Christian church is called the soul friend. Mm. And so that says a lot. You know, it, it, it says that the soul friend is someone who walks alongside the directee in his or her walk with the Lord. And so at times it might mean uh, um, the prayer, I believe the spiritual director should be praying at all times as best as he or she can for the person in their presence. And as they're doing that, there may be times necessary where verbal, externally heard prayers are, are welcomed. There might be other times when uh, uh, other actions, like you, like you said, uh, Metropolitan Anthony as a priest, treated someone first as a medical doctor for that person's spiritual well-being. That also is how a healthy soul friend may operate if he or she had that kind of ability. And so there's a lot more um, uh, nuance to what it means to be a spiritual, spiritual director rather than telling someone, you know, being uh, listening and then telling someone what to do, uh, offering sage advice as opposed to hearts hearing hearts entering mm -hmm. the holy ground of one another's soul. I had this kind of experience with uh, with a priest who was assigned to be the confessor of a group who decided to start a monastery. Uh, and it was women's monastery. So he was assigned to listen to these women's confessions. And he came out sometimes. We lived in the same village. And I was in a seminary, so we shared uh, opinions sometimes and he always said that it was so hard to hear things and uh, sometimes he said that when he comes out of the confession room he feels completely empty he feels like shell empty shell and that uh, in that sense does our confession affect the person who listens to it uh, what what kind of Hopefully, as the, a, confessor, as a psychologist, hopefully the confessor is seeing someone, is seeing their own confessor, or is, seeing a, uh, is talking to two or three healthy, spiritually healthy persons without at all divul divulging anything confidential from what's mm -hmm. heard, but, but how this is touching him. Um, we talked earlier today that sometimes uh, th there are many writers in the ancient church that really urge all people to look for a healthy spiritual father, spiritual mother, and that uh, it's very important to have a director because if you don't, and uh, St. Dorotheos of Gaza is one, he says, if you don't, it's like you are a little dried leaf, not a living leaf on the tree, <laughs> but a dried leaf being blown around anywhere the wind blows. And so it's really important. At the same time, we can't always find the right person at the right time, being in the, in the circumstances that we live. God knows our circumstances. God knows our hearts. We've said this over and over again in the past. God knows our whole experience from the inside out. And so further down in that same writing of St. Dorotheos of Gaza, he says, if you don't find the right person right away, rather than only books, because many fathers say, then, you know, keep looking, but do a lot of reading. 
And that's good because God may direct us to some very good reading to help us in our growth. But he would say, and I might have shared this before in a previous visit, find two or three, a small group of people, not too many, with whom you can share your entire self with. Now, remember the story I said earlier today with you about you and Kelly. In other words, not to split. You know, you say everything. You give your whole self to each one of those people as a substitute or a step to hold you while you are looking for uh, the right person. In a way, it's more work, you know, than, than uh, finding one person. Why? Because we, it is good to come clean with someone. But we don't have to do it with the whole world. In um, action of confession, do you think that most important part is to clear it out? Because for me, it will bring to ultimate humility. And like in the beginning of the show, I told the story about me not a being able to say what was the truth. And later on, I was able to do it. Because throughout the life, it's like at that point, when I was four years old, it started. And then I was always great. Everybody had the best opinion. And in, in, in my heart, I felt that their opinion is fake. I'm not really that. But I never said it. And years later, when I was probably 25 or 26, somebody sent me a letter praising me. You're so good, based on some actions that had happened to me. And I was brave enough to write her back and say, no, this is not right, this is not right, this is not right. And I, in the end, I said, well, this has happened to me entire my life, and I, I'm full of it. I don't want this anymore. And um, after that, I realized it brought me down into, into the mud. I realized who I was. And that was really painful. So. In, in a sense, that particular person that I wrote to didn't give me any advice, didn't help me at all. She didn't even talk to me after that <laughs> anymore. Um, but I found myself who I was. I kind of took it out. I, uh, you are talking about I was humble enough to say what... Bless you, bless you. Because you're talking about who we are, again, stri striving to be who you are in the presence of God. And there were others around you uh, projecting onto you their definition of who you are. And that happens all the time. It's human, but we have to be aware of it, especially it can be a bad projection, it can be a good projection. Uh, there are many books today on the, on the, on the shelves of, of, self, of the self-help section of the bookstores that will describe the, some of these roles. And sometimes someone is given the role to be the star or the superhero of the, of the family. Uh, maybe you were, you were that. There are other roles that get projected, though. There's the black sheep. There's the mascot, the one that entertains and is the jokester. There's the lost sheep. Mm -hmm. uh, and so sometimes uh, uh, we are given that, and that's the role we play our whole lives, and we don't look at the real self beyond that. Or sometimes the roles switch on us. One way or other, all of these roles are a distraction to who we really are in the presence of God. And it's a wonderful thing that you were able to sort of um, tear yourself away from that golden cage. Mm -hmm. It's a golden cage. And uh, you're freer now. And, and maybe you're platinum, not gold, you know? <laughs> so, but you couldn't discover that. You couldn't become the diamond you're becoming, for example, unless you were to leave that golden cage, you know, that's, that says you were gold. And, but you weren't gold. You were maybe something even more or better. But, but all of us, now you, I'm using you as an example, but this is true for all of us. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, but you also asked another question right before that about being in confession, what's the most, is it the catharsis of the confession that's the most healing? I think that's part of it because it's an opening, because when we open, that makes us available to receiving the love of God all the more. It makes us available to, it opens the doors of our hearts. And so my hope would be as we open our hearts, because sometimes I might not remember everything I had in mind to say, but my intention is to say everything, and it's the opening of the heart. And as I am opening my heart in confession, hopefully the con my confessor is, is opening uh, their heart so that um, uh, as I am carried in the love of God, also through their arms, um, I experience the Lord's love. 
directly. Mm -hmm. I have heard this kind of uh, comparison between Christianity and, and Oriental religions. I think it was compared to yoga. It says that both of these have a way of leading someone to salvation. The person who was writing was writing from the Oriental perspective. He wasn't a Christian person. And he says, although being Oriental, he says that Christianity and this particular type of yoga are like this. One is like a cat carrying the baby, and the other one is like a monkey carrying a baby. When the monkey is carrying her baby, the baby is catching from the mother, and it, its baby is the responsibility to hold on while the monkey is running through the forest. When the cat is carrying the baby, the mother is holding the baby and going through, so the baby doesn't have any responsibility, but just sometimes say meow and remind the mother and make sure that mother is there and she's holding him or her. So after our discussion, this is kind of a fact of humility also, to be humble so much so that you can uh, completely trust yourself to your mother and she will carry you. You're completely depending on her rather than on your own hands. I think both are good. I think uh, in the spiritual life, and there might be other metaphors as well besides the, 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 the mother cat carrying the little cat and the mother monkey carrying the little monkey. There might be, or little baby, uh, there might be other animal styles as well. And I think humility means uh, to every season, there, there, there is its challenges, and and we are at our own uh, place of growth and healing, or, or hurting, that requires its own therapy, its own therapy, its own healing. And so sometimes I think the foundation has to be that complete surrender. I, uh, I injured my hand yesterday, so I don't want to show everybody my other hand, um, but the complete surrender of of being, being, um, turning ourselves over to the to the love of God, which the kitty cat metaphor brings. But sometimes, once we do that, maybe sometimes we have to be the monkey kind of holding on while, while mom's running through the forest. So maybe those, both those metaphors are true, uh, but always after the surrender to the love of God, um, surrendering our, our fallen ego-ness. Now let me tell you about my hand a little bit. Okay. Because in a sense that, I started to tell you before we started, that I thought, it, gee, it, it's, we have to talk about humility today, meaning uh, that we're, that we're um, taping on a Monday, uh, because yesterday uh, uh, before church uh, on a Sunday, um, I wound up uh, having a moment of extreme pride, extreme. You know how uh, since 911 we have those, um, the gradations of safety, you know, green and then yellow and then orange and then red being the most, okay. I, I'm probably someplace in orange most of the time, maybe orange, yellow, I'm not green, as being, being humble. If green is humble, then I'm someplace up, you know. But I think yesterday I had a moment of red, and that's when I hurt my arm. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and what happened was um, we had our church picnic over the weekend, it was very successful, it was wonderful, it was a blessing. And before church, uh, uh, I went to help just for a few minutes because everybody's local and they know what they're doing and I'm coming in with my husband and I just try to help out a little bit when I can when I'm there. And so I put the creamers out for the coffee hour, which was, you know, thank you, thank you God, a no-brainer that I could do. And then I was watching that uh, a group of tables needed to be moved. And, um, and I know the men were getting ready to move them and I saw one of the men had hurt his back, a wonderful man, I was a little bit protective of him. And I said to him, um, well, you know what, I, let me, when I put the creamers out, let me help you, because I'm, I'm strong like bull, you know? And I bragged about myself, and I went on, and I said a few things that were really bragging about how strong I am. And I was clearly in the red, and as I was bragging, <laughs> I moved my hands like this, and I knew I was bragging, and I was having, I was way titillated. And yes, I wasn't disconnected from God, but I, but I, said, I said to God, okay, be here, but let me just, let it be all about me for one second. The second I said, let it be all about me for one second in my mind, I hit the, the, um, the lip of the, our stainless steel sink, which turns over and has like a knife edge mm. with my hand. And I, um, 
I gave, I've given myself a beautiful gash that was bleeding, and I had to go to the ER. And I spent most of my morning yesterday in the ER waiting to get stitches in my hand. So that is my souvenir for my little tryst into, oh, let me just be all about me just for a couple of seconds about how I am, a strong like bull. Oh, I'm thick-skulled. And to, maybe to insult, to call myself thick-skulled like a bull might be, might be insulting the bull. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um. <laughs> That's, anyway, That's a sad and I, story, then I thought, but it's a wonderful but, story. Yeah, but I thought, okay, isn't it perfect that tomorrow I'm going to be talking with Arkady about humility because I, I know, I was conscious that this was way out of line for me. You know, I'm, I'm trying to be in the green, and I was just taking a quick vacation into the red just for the fun of it, and I paid. I'm glad I paid. <laughs> I'm glad I paid. Uh, I have an interesting question about, about proud people. Uh, how do you who, who are in the red all the time. <laughs> <laughs> how do you relate to these people? Because at work I have experienced relationship with people who, when you say um, this is done this way, by the time you say this, the person says, I know, I know, I will do it. Uh, and um, it's all about themselves. Sometimes I know I, I'm great, uh, how wonderful I am. They even say it out loud. Uh, how do you relate with these people? Do you just pray for them? Do you direct them? Uh, how do you help them? Well, first, there but by the grace of God go we, because we can all fall into that notice. Mm -hmm. little, little souvenir today for me. I'm there. I was there. And, and I might not be at the green. I might be a little bit lower from the red, but I don't know. You know, I have to keep an eye on this. And, um, but what you're talking about is when we get high on ourselves. We get high on our delusions of grandeur. And all delusions are that. They're not true. They're a delusion. They're a lie. They're crazy. It really <laughs> is. We can say crazy. You know, I don't like as a psychologist to use the word. But that's when something is truly, uh, when we are delusional about our own, um, about, uh, about who we are, that's not true. Then, then, then it is something that's not sane. And so uh, when someone is high on themselves, well, it's like being intoxicated. It's like being drunk. And an Alcoholics Anonymous and a Narcotics Anonymous, when someone is high or when someone is drunk, they are very clear on how to respond to that situation. You don't argue with a drunk. Mm -hmm. It's impossible to argue with a drunk. So if someone is high on their delusions of grandeur, if someone is high on control and power, you can't, you, if they really are high, if there's no negotiating, because they, it would mean they would, they, they would lose in some manner from their, from their prestige that they have for themselves. Uh, as, 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 as someone I love would say, they are legends in their own mind. And so if, if somehow we challenge their being a legend in their own mind, then we are arguing with a drunk, and we can't argue. Mm -hmm. What about service? Can we serve them? In what way? Just be an example of uh, humility. We don't have to enable them, but we can still be benign and loving. We can be benign and loving. Christ says in, in the New Testament that when you're standing up in front of God to pray and you remember you have something with your brother, leave that prayer and go and make peace with him. I would like you to just explain this to our audience. How do you understand it? What do you understand from the humility perspective, from prayer perspective? What, why, why is it more important to make friends, I mean, make peace with your friend than to pray? And what is the significance of this suggestion that Christ gives us? Well, when we are, when we knowingly, because sometimes we're not ready to, uh, understand how we may have hurt someone and and that happens because no one's perfect no one's very few people are completely spiritually mature people and so uh, when we knowingly are about to uh, uh, offer our whole selves to God in prayer um, and uh, it comes to our mind that we have we have um, it's not clean our relationship is not clean with someone else uh, we are um, we are, in a sense, in, that, in those parts of ourselves, we are closing the door to God. And so uh, it, th I think that is one reason why. In order to uh, experience the offering, to be able to offer completely, and to be, that offering to be received, is to do everything we can 
as peacefully as we know how, to make amends with that person. Mm -hmm. Now, this 12-step world, AA, NA, all the other 12-step uh, groups have a wonderful and mature uh, approach to this in the sense that they say it's important to, to make amends with the people we've, whom we've hurt. It's important to, uh, if we can, to rectify the situation and with interest. Amends means not just to rectify, amends means to do whatever is necessary to heal your side of the bridge completely. Now there's a story of, was it Zacchaeus in the, in the, um, in the New Testament where he was a tax collector and he climbed a tree just to see Jesus pass by and in the end Jesus calls him down and he, Jesus has supper with him. But in the conversation between the two, which was an honor to be with the rabbi, Zacchaeus said, Lord, I want you to know that everybody that I have sinned against, I have corrected the situation, and I've paid them back fourfold. Mm -hmm. And so that is an example of humility, that the surrendering of all grandiosity, of all fallen self-will, so that we can peacefully be received by the love of God. And so making an amends, is, a, is a, an important beginning. And when we can't make it directly, the 12 step, and I want to say that here because it's very good advice for everyone. We can't make it directly for reasons of safety or, or practicality, that there, there are ways of, of, of doing that amends that uh, are symbolic and yet practical at the same time. Mm -hmm. I had a question, but I think we're running out of time about the family uh, relationship within the family. I know that you have many patients that have problems in their families and you give them advice and uh, you have seen a lot, I, I believe, um, with divorces and messed up relationships. Uh, I would like to speak about this. Maybe we can talk about this next time to make a complete uh, topic. What kind of role does humility have in the family? I think that's one of the key points that because of the absence of humility, my families suffer a lot. So we'll leave this for the next time. And I would like to conclude today's topic. I found a nice, very unique explanation to the verse that Christ tells about the lost ship. Usually we find explanations so telling us that the lost sheep is a person that the good shepherd leaves his 99 sheep and goes to find that one lost sheep and brings him back. And this explanation, it was a little bit abstract. It says that this 99 are our virtues and that one lost sheep is the sin that we have and even though we have 99 good virtues, that's not any good for us. The important is that lost ship we have to go after and find it and bring it back and make a virtue into complete our virtues. And again, uh, in the New Testament, Christ says that if you break one of the laws, even though you're keeping the other nine, you are still at fault. So I think humility is the key here again to... Um, to live all our virtues, to live all the commandments that we do and follow the one. And uh, again, the rich man, Christ says, what are you doing? Uh, live, live everything and follow me. And he couldn't because... <laughs> so... Uh, he was attached. Yes. So we, maybe we can speak about attachments and family next time if you're open to that. Um, the humility in the, in the family. And I want to thank you very much, dear audience. We will meet again next time and we will speak about the family, institution that is in the most painful situation in the modern life and it needs a lot of help. And because of the disconnect between the older generation and the younger generation, it suffers. So any suggestion that we can find, any suggestion that Presbyterian can give us will be a big help. Thank you very much and have a good day.